Alright guys, welcome to our last presentation. We are going to get through this chapter even if it kills us. <laughs> I'll now introduce you to our final subject, protein structure, which I'll begin by using a brief metaphor. As you can well imagine, if we were trying to describe the Earth's geographic makeup, we might begin by dividing it into two hemispheres. We could then divide each of those hemispheres into continents, and then divide up each of those continents into countries, and then each of those countries into provinces or states, and then each of those states into counties, and so on. To put it another way, when we look at a map of the globe from a satellite's perspective, that is a very zoomed out point of view, our view is very large. The amount or the scope of geography that we see is very broad, but the amount of detail that we see is quite small. As we zoom in to hemisphere and then country and then state or province and then county, etc., our view uh, or the amount that we're seeing decreases, but the detail increases. I want you to keep this analogy in your minds as I introduce you to this topic. You see, we chemists like to describe protein structure also at different levels. We use four levels, in fact. Primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure. I'll now describe what each of these terms means. A protein's primary structure is the most detailed or zoomed in way of describing it. Simply put, the primary structure of a protein is its amino acid sequence. Now proteins often contain hundreds or even thousands of amino acids, so determining that sequence can sometimes be a challenging task. This task is accomplished more or less by chemically tearing the proteins apart, identifying the resulting fragments structures individually, and then figuring out, almost detective-like, how those individual fragments went together in the original protein. I'll now introduce you to a few different ways that we tear proteins apart into individual fragments. The first thing that we do is we cleave or tear apart the disulfide bridges. So you might remember me talking in our previous presentation about how cysteine amino acids and peptides can bind with each other to form disulfide bridges. We can cleave that by treating uh, our protein initially with a compound called tumor captoethanol shown here, which happens to smell like diarrhea. Now, I just want you guys to know I don't really care if you know the sequence. I just want you to understand that the first thing that we do when we're trying to tear our protein apart is we get rid of those disulfide bridges. The next step we do is we take uh, or try to figure out the number and kinds of amino acids. This is done by breaking the protein apart into its individual amino acid components by heating the holy crap out of it with 6 molar HCl. So I might have a protein that's composed of hundreds or thousands of amino acids. I boil the snot out of it with aqueous HCl and what it does is it breaks every single amid or peptide bond in the entire protein, hydrolyzes it to make uh, to give the individual amino acids all floating around in solution. Once I've done that, then I can figure out uh, what amino acids are present in that protein and in what amounts by taking this mixture of amino acids and putting it in a, an amino acid analyzer. Now how that analyzer works is covered in section 23.5. I didn't discuss it, but if you want to, you're welcome to refer to that section. Once again, that analyzer tells us how many amino acids there are of each type and what types there are present in this protein. Now at this stage, we don't yet know what order the amino acids were in. All we know is which ones there were and in what amounts. To figure out the order that they're in, we have to take another sample of the original protein and start treating it with various reagents that selectively cleave or break apart specific peptide bonds, separating that protein out into individual fragments. These fragments can then be analyzed individually. It's much easier to analyze and figure out the sequence of a fragment than it is an entire protein. 
So we analyze the individual fragments and figure out what their sequences are. And then once we do that, we detective-like go backwards and figure out how each of these fragments went together uh, to constitute the entire original protein. Now there are numerous agents that we chemists can use to break proteins apart for chemical analysis. One of these is called Edmonds reagent, which selectively removes a single amino acid from the N terminus of the protein. Now we can see that in the overall reaction here. I have a peptide drawn here, which could be dozens uh, or even hundreds of amino acid, acids long. This end, where the nitrogen is, you'll remember, is called the N terminus. And this end is called the C terminus. Now this squiggly line here represents all of the other amino acids in this peptide that I really don't want to draw. This could be, once again, a few dozen. It could be dozens or hundreds of amino acids here. What I've done is I've just drawn the last two amino acids uh, on the N terminus end of our peptide. So when I treat this peptide with Edmonds reagent, what it does is it tears off the last amino acid on the N terminus. So in other words, it breaks apart this bond right here and leaves me this product too, which you should notice is exactly the same structurally as my original peptide, except that it's one amino acid shorter. Where did that amino acid go? Well, it went into this product. So it's incorporated into this. This product, one, can be analyzed. And once we figure out what this R side chain is, we can determine the identity of the amino acid that was found here at the N terminus end of the peptide. So we've now figured out what the identity of the N-terminal amino acid was. What do we do now? Well, what we can do is we can take this product, too, and then treat it with Edmonds reagent and cleave off this amino acid, identify it. And then we can take the next product and treat it with Edmonds reagent and figure out uh, and cleave off the uh, N-terminal amino acid of it and figure out what that amino acid was, and so forth, and so on, and so forth, until we've sequenced or figured out what the identity is of every single amino acid in this entire peptide in order. Now, as you can probably imagine, doing this Edmund degradation work is really impractical and tedious for large peptides of proteins. Uh, for large peptides and proteins, we instead use enzymes that are called endopeptidases that selectively break only one type of bond in the middle of the peptide chain somewhere. Now, there are numerous endopeptidases, but there are only two that I'm going to require you guys to know or be familiar with, trypsin and chymotrypsin. So trypsin selectively cleaves the amide bond on the carbonyl side, or on the right side, of these amino acids, lysine and arginine. Chymotrypsin does the same thing, except it only does it to the right side of phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. Once again, I hope you understand what I'm saying. If I have an, a huge peptide and I treat it with trypsin, what happens is trypsin looks down that peptide at anywhere it sees lysine or arginine, it just breaks the bond to the right of only those two amino acids, and it doesn't touch any of the others. Chymotrypsin does the same thing, except it does it for phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. So are you ready for some questions? Good. Let's take a look at my first lecture problem for the day. I want you to give me the amino acid sequence of the hexapeptide, that is, a peptide containing six amino acids, that contains arginine, glycine, isoleucine, leucine, proline, and valine and produces the following fragments when hydrolyzed with acid. Proline, leucine, glycine, arginine, proline, and glycine, isoleucine, valine. So in other words, here, what is a peptide that has these six amino acids in it? We took that, uh, treated it with acid, and broke it apart into a couple of different fragments. And these are the three fragments. Can you figure out what the original order of the entire six-membered long peptide was? I'll let you figure that out. Pause now if you want, because of course, I'm going to give you the answer momentarily. So let's now look at these fragments. You'll notice that these two fragments 
proline, leucine, and glycine, as well as arginine and proline, both contain proline. Similarly, these two fragments, proline, leucine, glycine, and glycine, isoleucine, valine, both contain glycine. So here's the deal. Because we are told in this problem that our peptide has six amino acids, and there are six different amino acids to choose from, it means that we couldn't have used any of these twice. So what does that mean? What it means is that I ha all I have to do is line these things up. I'll start with arginine proline and line it up with this fragment, proline, leucine, glycine, and then line this fragment up with glycine, isoleucine, valine. The original peptide then is this one. So once again, what that means, here was the original peptide. I heated it with acid. Some of that peptide got broken apart to generate arginine proline fragments. Some other samples of that peptide in solution got broken apart to generate proline leucine glycine fragments. And some other samples of that peptide broke apart to form glycine isoleucine valine fragments. I hope that makes sense. If not, you're welcome to pause it, think about it, and ask me more in class.